Hello guys and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian cases and today we are covering another solved case. And this case is, I feel, not only an important one to cover, but an important story to share with those that you know. But I'll explain exactly why as we go on. Oh, and by the way, this case is going to make you angry as heck, so be warned. But before we get into it, I want to thank today's brand new sponsor, and that is Surfshark. And this was pre-filmed, by the way, so outfit change in 3, 2, 1. So Surfshark is a VPN service, and if you're anything like me and a little technologically challenged, you may not know what a VPN is and how it can completely change your experience on the internet. Basically, a VPN is a virtual private network that allows you to access things on the internet not available in your country, but in a safe way. On top of that, a VPN adds an extra layer of security and privacy by keeping your personal information safe and browsing activity hidden. So for example, with a VPN, I can access Netflix US from Australia and a bunch of other countries' Netflixes uh, <laughs> by changing the location on whatever device I'm on. And this is honestly probably my favorite thing about Surfshark. When I got myself onto Netflix US for the first time a couple of months back, I cannot tell you how excited I was to see Dexter on there. I have legitimately not seen Dexter since it first aired in like 2008. Although FYI, I heard it's being removed soon if it hasn't already. But of course, there is like a ton of other things to watch on Netflix is around the world. <laughs> Another huge plus for me is that a VPN allows me to access information on cases that I may not otherwise have access to. And this doesn't just apply to videos that I make, but anytime I'm curious about a case, I can easily access articles, videos, etc. that are sometimes blocked in Australia. So if you want to try a Surfshark for yourself, use my code Samantha Melanie, one word, to get 83% off plus three extra months for free. Also, they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. And of course, the link will be in the description down below. And having said all of that, let's get into today's case. So we're heading back to the year of 1986 in Sydney, Australia. And yes, somehow this is my third Sydney case in a row. <laughs> there lived a nine-year-old schoolgirl named Samantha Therese Knight. She was born on March 27, 1977 to parents Tess Knight and Peter Omar. And was actually born Samantha Omar, but after her parents divorced pretty early on in her life, her last name was changed to Knight. And Samantha spent her early years in the suburb of Manly before moving to Bronte with her mum after the divorce. And by 1986, Sam and her mum were living in the beachside suburb of Bondi at a block of flats in Imperial Avenue. So now we're going to talk about August 19, which was a Tuesday. And and a school day for Samantha. Sam attended school and in the afternoon, as she often did, she let herself in the house or flat at around 4.15pm. So Samantha was basically a latchkey kid, which was pretty common back in the 1980s, even for very young children. That era, and especially in such a safe suburb like Bondi, it was really normal for kids of Sam's age to be home alone, have a house key, and then go play on the streets after school with the other kids. Kids in general really just had a lot more freedom back then because things were so much more relaxed from what I can gather at least it's a little bit before my time but if you're an Aussie 80s latchkey kid comment down below and tell us a bit about it and maybe clarify a bit more what it's like or what it was like 
But anyway, that afternoon, Sam got home, turned the TV on and made herself a snack. And then she got dressed out of her uniform into a bright pink skirt, a blue sloppy joe jumper and some open toe sandals. She then half ate her snack and headed out the door. A few hours later, Sam's mother, Tess, then 28 years old, got home from work where she found Sam's half eaten snack on the kitchen table. But this wasn't alarming to Tess as Sam and the other neighborhood kids would often go out onto the streets after school and play for a couple of hours. And then Sam usually arrived home not too long after her mum. But as night fell, Tess grew concerned. She went around to ask neighbours if they had seen Sam, and then she started ringing around to friends and family. But no one knew where Sam was. Uh, by the way, I just realised I have been interchanging between Sam and Samantha, which I will probably continue to do out of habit because... Uh, you know, it's my name. But anyway, <laughs> by 8pm, Tess reported her daughter missing and a search quickly began. It was established that Sam had been seen at a number of locations that afternoon, all on Bondi Road between Imperial Ave and Wellington Street between the hours of around 4.30pm and 6.45pm. I'll pop a map up on the screen to give you a better idea of this location. So let's run through the witness sightings. Sam was seen at a local store buying pencils and then at a local news agency buying some lollies. At around 5.30pm, a woman said that she saw Sam, who told her that she had lost her house key. And then at 6.30pm, Sam was seen going into a pharmacy to buy a toothbrush, which I did find a little odd. But hey, we all need a toothbrush. Maybe her mum gave her some money to buy a new one. And the last sighting of Sam was at 6.45pm, not far from her flat, walking in the direction of her home. I'm honestly not sure how many of these witness sightings have been confirmed to be Samantha, but either way, no one knew where Sam had ended up that evening. The following day, a large-scale search began, with thousands of volunteers turning up to look for Samantha. The media also started reporting on the missing nine-year-old schoolgirl, and pretty much as soon as it hit the media, it, it blew up. Everyone was talking about Sam's disappearance. The entire country, but especially Sydney, wanted to know what had happened to Samantha Knight. And during the late 80s and early 90s, everyone pretty much knew her name and her story. I think today that might not be so much the case from what I can tell, which is really one of the reasons why I felt it was so important to discuss this case. But there is another very important reason why I chose to discuss this particular case, which I'll discuss with you very soon. And especially if you live in Sydney, please watch until the end. Honestly, even if you skip till the end, there is some information there really worth knowing. And the public back then as well did feel incredibly strongly about this case and of course finding Sam. I would honestly compare this case to the Maddie McCann case as far as media coverage and how strongly the public felt about it within Australia at least. And to be honest I'm not sure if this case ever reached overseas media coverage but if you're overseas you have to let me know. I'd also love to hear from you if you lived in Sydney or even Australia during this time period and what you remember about this case because I'm just going off things I read online or watch online as to how big this case was but was it as big as I think it was? And what do you remember about it? So anyway, an investigation was underway to find Sam, but realistically, at the time, the police basically had nothing. There was no helpful witness sightings. No one heard a scream, a struggle. Sam was not a suspected runaway. Nothing of Sam's had been left behind, and there was 
Certainly no CCTV back then, not in that area at least. By all accounts, Sam had disappeared into thin air on the afternoon of August 19. Police did attempt to jog the public's memory by dressing up a mannequin in what Sam had been wearing the day she disappeared, and they displayed it in Bondi, and they also recreated Sam's last movements using a child lookalike actor, but unfortunately, no useful leads came out of any of this, and fears began to grow that Sam had been abducted and was likely deceased, or possibly had even been sold into child trafficking and was overseas. And sadly, this is one of those cases where I say that days turned into weeks, weeks into months, and months into years, and still, there was no sign of Samantha Knight. So now we're going to skip ahead a fair amount of time to 1998, so 12 years since Sam's disappearance, where I'd say the first real clue was found in the Samantha Knight case that pointed to a legitimate suspect. Michael Anthony Guider, who at this point had been sitting in jail since 1996, became a person of interest when photos of Samantha, as well as newspaper cutouts of her disappearance, were found in his storage unit. But we're going to get back to that in just a moment. First, let's talk about who Guider was and why he was in jail. So I'm going to put a trigger warning here. From this point forward, there's going to be mentions of sexual abuse against children. And I will be going into absolutely no detail whatsoever regarding the abuse. But if this is a subject that triggers you, it is best to switch off now. And also, if you do look up this case or look at my resources, many of them do go into explicit detail. On this channel, though, I personally will never go into any details, especially when it comes to this topic. So Michael Guider was born on October 20, 1950 in Melbourne, Australia, to a mother he would later say sexually abused him from a very young age. Guida also had a brother, Tim, who was three years younger than him, and by the time the brothers were both in their teens and living in Sydney by this point, their mother sent them away to a boy's home. At the boy's home, Guida was drugged, sexually abused, and threatened by his abuser to not say a word about it. Guida then became aware that his abuser was sexually abusing other young boys in the home, including his own brother. Still, Gaida said nothing, and in fact, he himself began to sexually abuse other boys in the home. As an adult, his brother Tim would go on to commit an armed robbery and spend a number of years behind bars. But by all accounts, Tim did seem to clean up his life post-prison and would later go on to be of some assistance in the Samantha Knight case. Michael Guider went on to become a gardener and a self-taught expert in Aboriginal rock art. And in fact, he was considered so much of an expert that he appeared on TV and in at least one publication. Now let's talk about why Guider was in prison from 1996. In that year, 1996, Guider was arrested and charged with over 60, that's six zero, crimes of sexual abuse against 11 children, all aged between 2 and 16 years old, dating back to the early 1980s. And this arrest only happened because a very brave little seven-year-old girl finally had the courage to tell her mother what Michael Guider had been doing to her and a friend. And of course, these 11 children are only the victims that we know of. In many cases of sexual abuse, children are too scared to say anything. They don't understand what has happened to them, or they've been threatened or manipulated by their abuser into silence. And in my opinion, Guida had many 
many more victims. So Gaida pled guilty to these crimes and received a 16 year sentence with a non-parole period of 10. And the reason for this weak sentence, from what I was reading at least, was because he pled guilty really early on and because of his troubled upbringing. So let's go through what Gaida's modus operandi was or the ammo that he used to manipulate his victims. For years, Gaida would insert himself into the lives of young, single and often drug addicted mothers. He was apparently quite charismatic, a real talker, so he easily made friends with these women and their children. In fact, he was really good with children. In fact, he was so good with children that some of them referred to him as Uncle Mike, which honestly makes me shudder. And Gaida would tell these women things like, they worked so hard, they deserved a night out, a day to themselves, etc, etc. And these women would agree, they did deserve that, which they did. And next thing they knew, Gaida was offering to babysit their children for the day and they would accept this offer. To them, Gaida seemed harmless, friendly and helpful. And once Gaida was alone with the children, he would offer them a bottle of Coke. And let's face it, there isn't many kids out there that are going to turn down a bottle of Coke. So uh, the child would drink this Coke and pass out. And this was because Gaida had spiked the drink with the sleeping pill Normison. Once the child was out cold, Gaida would take photos of them that he referred to as happy snaps and sexually abuse them. Now let's go back to talking about that storage unit. In jail, Gaida, I guess, had a pretty big mouth and told a few of his fellow inmates of a storage unit he had that police were yet to discover. And this would certainly not be the last time that Gaida would blab to an inmate. As I said, he was a real talker. But back to that point later. Anyway, as it goes in prison, these inmates dobbed Gaida in, probably hoping for a lighter sentence or something similar, and police successfully located this storage unit, which was in the suburb of Gerowene in Sydney. In the unit, investigators found thousands of images of young children, some inappropriate and some innocent. Well, hardly innocent in the hands of Gaida, but you know what I mean. Some were not of a sexual nature and some were. And amongst the photos were several innocent photos of Samantha Knight along with two other girls. And I'm actually going to put some of these photos on the screen for you. But there is one photo that I will not put on the screen. And that's not because it's of a highly sexual nature, but honestly because it's disturbing as all heck. The picture shows a photo of Sam and another girl lying on the floor, and Sam's lying between the legs of this girl, clearly passed out. The other girl, whose dress has been pulled up enough to show her underwear, also looks pretty out of it. Several more photos were found that they thought may be Sam that were of a sexual nature, but these have never been proven to be Sam. So of course, investigators tracked down the two other girls in these photographs, and this led them to one girl who was now 21 years old that had lived on Raglan Street in the suburb of Manly, when Sam went missing. She was one of Samantha's best friends and also happened to be babysat by Michael Gaida. Unfortunately, this girl and her mother were also unwilling to talk to the police about any of this. This was until they were subpoenaed the following year, but we'll get back to that soon. The second girl in the photos who had since moved to Queensland was more willing to talk. She said Gaida abused her multiple times often when Sam was staying over. She also confirmed Sam had been babysat by Gaida on Raglan Street, meaning the photo in which Sam and her friend looked incredibly passed out 
was probably taken after they were both drugged by Guida. And this information also provided investigators with a witness that confirmed Guida had spent time with Sam and had babysat her. Up until this point, Guida had only admitted to knowing Sam and meeting her once or twice, but really having no association with her whatsoever. So these photographs were not the only disturbing thing found in Guida's storage unit. A number of scrapbooks were also discovered, one in particular titled Number 24B, Vanishing Children. And this scrapbook included newspaper cutouts of various children that had vanished over the years, including Samantha Knight and possibly Australia's most famous missing children's case, the Beaumont children. When Guida was asked about these unusual scrapbooks, he told investigators that he simply had a keen interest in mysteries and unsolved cases. And I mean, so do I. But most of us aren't out there making scrapbooks about it, I hope. But realistically, the scrapbooks were hardly illegal to possess. Creepy? Yes. Illegal? No. It was the photographs that were the issue. This new evidence led to Michael Guida receiving 11 new charges, all relating to sexual abuse, to which he pled guilty. Guida received an additional six years and six months. However, the six years were to be served concurrent with his already standing sentence, and only the six months would be tacked on the end of the existing sentence, if that makes any sense. So all in all, he only got an extra six months added to his sentence. Big whoop. The one positive was that finding the storage unit put a big spotlight on Guida's potential involvement in Sam Knight's disappearance. Although at this stage, it was all purely circumstantial and without a body or a confession, they kind of had nothing. And the other overall positive was that Guida frequently had the shit beaten out of him in prison, despite being under strict prison protection. And I think when it comes to child abusers, even prison guards turn a blind eye. And I would never condone violence, but when it comes to those that hurt children, hey, I wouldn't step in and stop it either. So now we're jumping ahead to the year 2000, a new millennium, and Gaida is still rotting away in jail. And still, there has been nobody held accountable for the disappearance of Sam Knight, which was at this point 14 years ago. But that was all about to change. A woman named Denise Hoffman, whose job title I'm not exactly sure of, but she did later go on to co-author a book about Samantha called Forever Nine, so I assume she is some sort of writer, author, journalist. But anyway, Denise had actually been friends with Michael Guider because of her own interest in Aboriginal rock art and spoke somewhat highly of his work, saying, quote, Michael was the leading expert in rock art in Sydney and we recorded a lot of the sites along the creeks flowing through Kellyville and Rouse Hill on their way back to Hawke's Ferry River. For years we would go and walk through both sides of the creek. His reports were very professional and highly detailed." End quote. And Denise was actually introduced to Guida through a friend of hers, a freelance journalist named Di Michelle. So Di one day came to Denise and told her that she was a little suspicious of their good friend Michael and his possible involvement in the Sam Knight case. Her reasoning behind these suspicions were because when she visited Guida, he would talk about Sam's disappearance almost in an obsessive way, to the point where it was kind of creepy. The only problem was that Di didn't want to report Guida because she felt as though she'd be betraying a friend. Luckily, Denise wasn't as good of a friend as Di was and took these suspicions to the police, who of course already suspected Guida. Denise tried visiting Guida in prison after this in an attempt to extract some sort of information 
out of him, but he pretty much refused to talk about Samantha. And it seemed like he really just reserved these creepy conversations for his friend, Di. So you may remember me mentioning Guida's brother, Tim, earlier. He also believed that his brother was involved in the Samantha Knight disappearance. So investigators decided to use him in an attempt to get a confession. And Tim actually consulted with a psychiatrist before he visited his brother to ask them the best way to extract a confession. And the psychiatrist told him to bring up the sexual abuse in the boys' home. So off Tim went to visit Michael and he asked his brother, do you feel guilty for not reporting your abuser? And as a result, this abuser went on to sexually abuse myself and others. I'm of course paraphrasing this. At this, Michael broke down and began crying and he confessed to accidentally killing Samantha Knight back in 1986. His confession was also backed up by two prison inmates that said Guida confessed to them to accidentally killing a girl named Sam back in the mid-1980s. So Guida's version of events went as follows. He abducted Sam Knight on the evening of August 19 during a chance encounter and took her somewhere, although he's never really clarified where, and gave her his usual bottle of coke that was spiked with Normison, and she passed out. Basically the same story as all of his other victims. However, Gaida says that during the abuse, Sam woke up and said to him, Michael, what are you doing? In response, he gave her another coke and she apparently passed out again. Gaida says he then left for a few hours and when he came back several hours later, Sam was dead. And of course, he assumed this was an overdose of the sleeping pills. After this, he says he disposed of her body and Gaida maintained his innocence throughout all of the questioning, saying it was just an accident and he never intended to kill Sam. In fact, he had intended to let her go. And hell look, I personally don't buy this story for a number of reasons. For one, he didn't usually abduct his victims, as far as we know. He would put himself in situations where he was in his care and then he would abuse them. And secondly, I feel like you'd need a lot of sleeping pills to die. Uh, and of course, I'm not a medical professional, so comment down below if you do have any knowledge in this area. And of course, then there's the fact that without a body, which they didn't have, he could really say what the heck he wanted and they couldn't prove it either way. So from my understanding, investigators were pretty happy just to have any kind of confession out of Gaida because without it, they didn't have enough to charge him with Sam's disappearance. Therefore, they were willing to cut him a deal. And in 2002, he pled guilty to the manslaughter of Samantha Knight. Michael Gaida ended up being sentenced to 17 years behind bars with a non-parole period of 12. And through this entire process, Gaida showed no remorse, didn't apologize, and didn't seem to even care. And of course, as I said earlier, Gaida was already in jail. So this new sentence was ordered to be served, I can't say this word, but cumulatively. Oh, I think that was correct. With his other charges, meaning when his old sentence ended, the manslaughter sentence begun. Now, I do want to quickly discuss the mother and daughter that I mentioned earlier that were not willing to talk to police when the photos of the daughter were found in Guida's storage unit. As I said, they were both subpoenaed, which means they both received a formal written order from the courts that they must testify. Or at least that's how I understand it. And by the way, neither of their names have been released. So I'm just going to say mother and daughter. So the daughter finally admitted to the police that she had been sexually abused by Guida in their Raglan Street home back in the 1980s, as had Samantha and another friend. 
She told investigators that when she was eight years old, she told her mother about the abuse. And when the two of them discussed it together, they decided not to report it or really bring it up again. And just to put the whole situation behind them. Uh, Fair enough. I think actually this is the perfect example of victims that don't want to come forward for whatever reason that may be. Some people just don't feel safe or they don't feel comfortable to do so. Except one month after she tells her mum, her good friend Samantha Knight goes missing. The mother and daughter even comfort Tess Knight, who has no idea about this abuse, and yet they still say nothing. The mother, however, later denied that Gaida ever even babysat for her and denied that Sam had even stayed overnight at her house. A statement that was contradicted by her own daughter, her boyfriend at the time, and neighbours. And to be honest with you, I feel really torn on this point because on the one hand, if they had just anonymously reported Michael Guider, I may have prevented so many more children being abused. But On the other hand, I am well aware that it is never the victim's fault. It's just hard for me to think that if they had reported him back in 86, things could have been different. And let's not forget, he wasn't arrested until 1996. That's 10 extra years he had to abuse children. But I really don't know how to feel about this one, so... I would like to hear your thoughts and how you feel because, as I said, I'm torn, but I'm also honestly angry. So at this point, I am yet to go into what Gaida did with Sam's remains. Initially, Gaida said that he forgot where he buried her body, but several years later, he miraculously remembers or more likely got bored in jail and just wanted some attention. He says that in 2003, he buried Sam's body in Cooper Park, which is in the suburb of Bellevue Hill, and about a 15-minute drive from where Guida lived in Kirribilli. Then he changed this statement and claimed that actually Sam was buried at a yacht club called the Royal Sydney Yacht Squadron, in Kirribilli, which is actually where Gaida worked as a gardener. And I did get a little confused after this point because some articles said that Gaida then dug up Sam's remains 18 months later and put them in a skip bin at the yacht club and others didn't mention it. But basically 18 months after Sam's disappearance, construction began at this yacht club to build a car park, meaning there would be a lot of digging taking place. And considering Guida worked there, he would have been more than aware of the construction coming up and more than likely moved her body. And very sadly, it seems to me that chances are, either way, Sam's remains have probably ended up in landfill, never to be recovered. And Michael's brother, Tim Guider, actually has his own theory about where he believes Sam's remains are, which he speaks about on his website, findsamantha.com, and he also started a podcast, so those links will be in my resources if you want to hear his point of view on this. Anyway, a dig was conducted at the yacht club where a sniffer dog ended up reacting positively to human remains, although they didn't find anything. So there is certainly a chance that Sam was once there, but was likely moved. So no matter how you look at it, Michael Guider has never given a straight answer in my opinion, as to where he put Sam's body. Because if he did, they might actually find out what happened to Sam and that manslaughter charge may be upgraded to something else. And not to mention, he also robbed Samantha's family of any level of peace and closure. And after so long, there still has been no place that they have been able to lay Sam to rest No place to visit her, to speak with her, to pay their respects. 
And realistically, to this day, we still really don't know what happened to Samantha Knight. We only have Guida's word, which, let's face it, cannot be trusted. We don't know if she suffered, if she was held captive, or if she died quickly. We don't know anything. And sadly, we probably never will. So we're going to jump ahead in the timeline once again, quite a few years to 2014. Because this was the year that Michael Guider's minimum sentence expired and he could start applying for parole. He applied several times over the years but was unsuccessful. Then 2019 rolled around and that June marked his maximum sentence expiry date. At this point, he had been behind bars for a measly 23 years. But of course, as you can imagine, there was more than a few people that wanted to see him kept behind bars for many years to come. For Samantha's family and all of Guida's victims, to name a few. Both the New South Wales Attorney General and the New South Wales Government fought to keep Guida in jail, as well as many others, and when June finally rolled around, they managed to get him a further 28 days, in which he was ordered to speak to a psychiatrist, and although this wasn't much, it bought them some time. Two more months passed, and despite the efforts of many, on September 3rd, a judge ruled that Michael Guida was to be released from prison. Two days later, at the age of 68, Guida walked out the front doors of prison, carrying with him two plastic bags, a free man. Unsurprisingly, several members of the public were waiting for Guida and began to heckle him, calling him a dog, a filthy piece of shit, amongst other things. Some even began to follow his vehicle. Upon release, he was given a five-year supervision order, but, I mean, really? So what? When push comes to shove, this won't stop him from re-offending if he really, really wants to. And the way I look at it, he went to jail in his mid-40s, and he was released in his late 60s. He got to live a whole life before jail, and he could live a whole life after jail if he wanted to. He could still get married, have kids, travel, Samantha will never get that chance. As part of his release conditions, he was fitted with an electronic monitoring bracelet and has had to follow quite a long list of conditions, 56 in total, and these include things like not drastically changing his appearance or his name, reporting his daily movements, abiding by a curfew, doing regular drug and alcohol testing, and he must also seek permission if he wants to visit places such as a public pool, library, cinema, museums, amusement parks, etc. But look, even his own brother thinks he's going to re-offend, so that hardly gives me any faith that he should be back in society. He may not re-offend during that five-year supervision order, but I guarantee you, the day that that is up, he will disappear, change his name, change his appearance, and pick up where he left off. But that's just my opinion. I also want to touch on the nobody, no parole law or lack thereof. I'll be honest, I have no idea if this law exists outside of Australia, but it means what it says. If an offender doesn't fess up where they hid the body, they are not getting out of jail. It has its pros and its cons, but I am personally all for it. We have it here in Western Australia and in several other states, but at least back in 2019, New South Wales did not have it, which was unfortunate because it would have kept Guida behind bars. But I would be curious to hear your thoughts on this law because I think it has been quite a controversial one, especially if someone was for example, to be convicted wrongly or wrongly convicted. And they, of course, are not going to know where the body is. And of course, I want to mention the reason why I decided to cover this case 
in the first place. And the reason I believe that it is so darn important to keep talking about Sam's case. And that's because Michael Guider is out there somewhere living amongst us and his whereabouts are not publicly known, not even to his victims. There are rumours that he is living in Sydney's south or east, but really no one knows. So if you live in Sydney, and especially if you have children, please be on the lookout for Michael Guider and tell your friends as well. Tell your family, tell everybody. But I do want to thank you for being here today and listening to Samantha's story. Uh, And not only Sam's, but every other victim in this case. And I want to thank my incredible channel members, my shining stars. But until next time, stay vigilant, stay safe, and I will see you soon. Bye, guys.